Uh, it is uh, a great pleasure to welcome you all to our first Cyber Series Lecture of 2021. Uh, today we have Dr. Barbara Vickery uh, join us. Uh, it is really uh, wonderful for me to have the opportunity to introduce Barbara. Uh, Barbara has spent most of her professional career at UCLA uh, and we uh, enticed her to join us about five years ago uh, to be chair of our Department of Neurology. It's been a lot of fun for me to work with Barbara over the last half decade. Hard to imagine it's already been that long, Barbara. And it's, it's just wonderful to see the transformational effects that Barbara has had on the department, uh, vastly growing our research, clinical, and educational activities. Uh, and today we're going to have the treat of listening to Barbara's research, which is long time focused on health outcomes related to a neurological condition. So Barbara, thank you so much for joining us and we're looking forward to your talk. Great, and thank you so much for inviting me to give a talk and uh, uh, it's, it's sort of this good time to sort of take stock of the last uh, five years and some of what I'll be talking about, the things put in motion uh, then and, and here's where we are today. So I'm gonna switch to the screen share here. This meeting is being recorded. Okay. All right. So um, uh, I'm going to be talking about um, a, a framework for thinking about translation of neuroscience research into what is everybody on this uh, uh, webinar would would I, their work I would think is aimed toward improving human health and um, uh, thinking about that in terms of populations. Uh, and also um, uh, in doing this in a way that reduces disparities. And, and I'll be talking about how we're defining that and how this research is relevant to that. So, um, there we go. So let me just set the stage. You may know some of this, but I think the numbers are always dramatic and it's worth looking at it again. Um, the US has had for a while a problem in our healthcare uh, on multiple fronts. Uh, one is that we uh, spend an awful lot of our uh, gross domestic product on healthcare. And you can see here in this graph going back to 1970, we're now up to above 16% of GDP. And uh, when you look at other countries, uh, other developed countries, um, you'll see that this blue line is sort of the average of those. And, and uh, they're spending far less percent of their GDP on healthcare. And you might say, well, that's okay as long as we're getting you know, extra health value from that. But when you look at metrics of, um, of healthcare and, and health outcomes, you find that uh, even though we spend a lot more, we're not seeing more. In fact, we're seeing in some areas worse health outcomes. So uh, this is a graph of life expectancy in years. That's the, the y-axis and the x-axis is healthcare spending per capita. And uh, so what you see is the US is way on the high side of health spending per capita, but uh, compared to a whole cluster of um, developed countries, but we're actually below life expectancy of, of many of those uh, countries. So, so we're not seeing that extra uh, value for the extra spent expenditures. And then when you, you can add to that uh, issues around health disparities. So uh, just to remind everybody, the World Health Organization defines that as differences in health, which are not only unnecessary and unavoidable, uh, but in addition are considered unfair and unjust. And um, not only are our costs higher, our life expectancy is, is not better, we have significant racial and ethnic disparities in health and healthcare. And I'm gonna show you a couple of slides, but um, uh, this is uh, data on neonatal mortality and post-neonatal mortality. Uh, 
for blacks and whites. This is uh, from an era in which there was uh, 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 structural differences in healthcare from segregation. There were um, uh, uh, segregation uh, by race up in hospitals and, and also uh, poor access to hospitals for women having deliveries. And those were major determinants of why you see in the first graph, um, <clears throat> white and black neonatal mortality in a period from 1935 to about 1960. Um, and then in the figure to the right, post neonatal mortality um, and neonatal mortality as a ratio of blacks to whites, um, which is very, very significant. And with the ending of segregation in hospitals with the introduction of Medicare and, and um, uh, enforcement of uh, one of the titles of the Civil Rights Act with that, um, we're still seeing a, a significant disparities in health by race. And here is a, a, a figure from uh, 1991 through 2000, uh, disparities in death rates of whites and blacks in the US by gender. And you'll see the highest age adjusted mortality per 100,000 is in um, African American males, followed by white males, followed by African American women, and then the lowest rates in white women. And the uh, back of the envelope calculation that these uh, folks uh, who, who published this in the American Journal of Public Health did was that if you could have gotten the death rates for African Americans to the same levels as whites over this period, there, there would have been 886,000 uh, 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 lives you know, not, not lost. Uh, so it's a pretty substantial disparity. And then taking it into neurology, um, this is an example, um, a study that was done to look at age of death um, for people with muscular dystrophy. They looked at death record data in the US over about a 20 year period. <clears throat> and it turned out that over this period, while there were no disease modifying therapies introduced, uh, there were a lot of um, uh, supportive care introduction, uh, introduced during this period, for example, to um, minimize or prevent complications of, of uh, cardiac involvement. And to the surprise of the investigators who published this data, because they weren't really looking for this, um, what they found was the median age of death for white males increased over this period. And it looked like this was because they had better access to this kind of supportive treatment. Whereas among black males, the median age of death was flat over this period. And there was some evidence that this was uh, uh, due to issues around access to this type of care. And um, more examples uh, for those of us uh, that remember when HIV was a disease you died from acutely or, or over a short period of time, there was a period in the late 1990s through amazing uh, research that was done where uh, disease prolonging, life prolonging uh, HIV treatment was developed and was approved. And it happened that over this two year period from 1996 to 1998, there was a national study being done that was representative of people in care for HIV. And they were able to document as part of that larger study that there was, yes, the good news was there was a, a marked introduction or use of that life-saving, life-prolonging treatment that turned HIV into a chronic condition over this two-year period of time. But what persisted was differences in access to that therapy between whites, Hispanics, and Blacks. So that difference over time remained in that disparity, which again translates into differences in, in death. So um, again, ultimately the goal of the, the neuroscience research to, to uncover mechanisms of disease and lead into studies of potential therapies, uh, that's that first translational 
figure here. By the way, this is a figure from the National Academy of Medicine um, Clinical Research Roundtable that was convened about 20 years ago uh, that was uh, had a lot of impact. It led to, for example, the CTSAs and a number of other um, developments because what they recognized was there were two um, bottlenecks in taking the investment in uh, society and mechanistic research into improved population health. And one of the bottlenecks was getting the mechanistic studies uh, into um, early human studies to, to, to figure out, are there safe potential therapies? And then once there was a, uh, there is a body of randomized trial evidence, there's a second bottleneck, which is scaling it up and, and, and making sure that that new therapy or therapeutic approach is actually delivered to populations. Um, and that is ultimately the success of that uh, society's investment in, in uh, research, in neuroscience research and other research. So why is there a gap? I mean, how did, why did they highlight that? And maybe you need some, some uh, evidence to, to, to believe it. Um, we certainly are seeing some, uh, I thought a recent good example is vaccines versus vaccinations. And uh, the public health officials, for those of you following this, have made a point of saying, it is fantastic that we have these incredible new COVID vaccines that are so highly effective. But what's gonna reduce and prevent hospitalizations and death and, co and morbidity is vaccinations. And we're seeing play out uh, week to week in front of us, um, a, 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 an example of, of, of a fabulous uh, uh, scientific breakthrough and a bottleneck going from that um, tested treatment into literally populations so that it can have an effect on outcomes. So keep that analogy uh, as you think about that, you could use the same thing for sort of less dramatic things perhaps, but going back to um, a, a landmark study by Beth McGlynn and a group out of Rand published in the New England Journal in 2003, they did a national representative sample of adults in care uh, and a broad range of conditions. And they took, uh, they made a, a, a tool to measure and record, abstract uh, the proportion of people who were receiving uh, uh, treatments across a range of conditions that had very strong clinical trial evidence. And what they found was across the board, only about half of people were actually receiving these recommended therapies. And so that's, a, that's an example of that bottleneck that again, you can do a back of the envelope calculation and say, well, you know, if you're not getting, um, let's say uh, hypertensive treatment uh, and, and, and effectively lowering your, your blood pressure, then that's translating into morbidity and death down the line. And there've been numerous studies. I've just put a group here, everything from, you know, they've looked at pediatric care. Certainly there are national studies looking at what proportion of the population has recognized and controlled hypertension. And it's gone up from 30%, I think in 1990 to 50% in 2010, but that's that's still a big gap. And, and I think the most recent data again shows uh, substantial gaps. And the goal is to get those numbers closer to 100% so that you get the full benefit on population health. So uh, there's a lot of evidence that there's a gap here. And one question is, well, why is that? You know, I, I had, um, had a conversation with somebody in a leadership position at a, uh, at a uh, major scientific institute who said, well, I don't understand if you publish the clinical trial, then why doesn't everybody just practice and use the treatment the next day? So it turns out there's a whole field of research, that's that second bottleneck, trying to unpack that and understand that. And I'm gonna show you one framework. It's the framework about diffusion of 
of innovations. Uh, there are other frameworks, but but I, I like this one. I, I think it, it helps to get some insight. So taking that model that I showed a little earlier and just taking the right-hand side, and you could say you have clinical trial evidence. Now, how do you get the uptake so that it results in improved population health? And you can go a route of, okay, it's, it's taken up and you get the good health, but what happens most of the time is there's delayed diffusion or low diffusion, or even sometimes inappropriate application of that treatment. And then you don't get those benefits. So what's the, the theory behind this? Uh, you know, what are some examples of this? So one of my favorites uh, is, um, and, and there's a wonderful book by uh, Everett Rogers about diffusion of innovations. And he talks about this across all different fields. It's not just healthcare. And, and, give, and I'm going to give you some of the examples. It's a broader phenomenon and has some um, um, you know, principles that drive it, which, which I'll show you. But here's a really extreme lag in probably the first healthcare example. Um, uh, it turns out that James Lancaster, uh, who was leading uh, or, or involved in uh, ships that went to East India to bring back, uh, to take goods and bring back spices and so forth. This was a major, you know, commercial endeavor, a very important for, you know, the, the countries involved. But a lot of crews were getting, um, were, were getting, were dying, and, and that was affecting the missions. Um, and it was due to scurvy, which they could describe, but people didn't know what caused it. But he actually did an experiment that involved some people getting some, some teaspoons of lemon juice over the course of the trip, some of the sailors, and showed like probably what would be astronomical effect sizes in terms of survival. Um, and uh, here's actually uh, from a book published later uh, uh, the, describing this uh, in 1600. But it was another 140 years before um, Lind actually did something like that. Uh, and theories about what caused scurvy were still all over the map. Um, and he found as well a dramatic survival among the sailors that had um, exposure to citrus product or citrus juice. But it was another 50 years before the British Navy set a policy saying you have to provide uh, 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 some form of uh, citrus on um, uh, the Navy ships. And it was another, what, 70 years before the Merchant Marine set a policy. So altogether about a 250 year lag between evidence and policies that were put in place that basically eliminated scurvy. So the idea about behind diffusion of innovations is that uh, Rogers describes diffusion as a process by which an innovation is communicated through certain channels over time among members of a social system. And the diffusion of innovations in healthcare would in, entail adopting and applying these types of new treatments and FDA approved treatment, for example, into routine care. Now, what's some of the evidence behind this? And again, from Roger's book, there's some wonderful examples. Some of the best examples are in agriculture or some of the earliest examples. And it turns out that the US really had a remarkable um, um, arrangement set up in the first part of the 20th century, and, and it's continued, where um, a number of agricultural colleges were set up that were experimenting with innovations in um, various crops. Um, and they partnered in a, in a, they had communication channels with the farmers in the Midwest through um, uh, several mechanisms. And that was what led to adoption and pretty rapid adoption of a number of these um, uh, innovations in, in um, uh, you know, to produce more resistant crops that were healthier or, or were denser and so forth to um, uh, led to, you know, in part why the US had what was called the breadbasket of, of, of the world through these uh, many of these innovations. So here's a graph of actual data about uh, the y-axis is farmers 
number of farmers adopting a new hybrid seed corn in two Iowa communities and the year. And you can see there's what's uh, what uh, Rogers has described in number of different adoption of innovations, an S-shaped curve uh, that characterizes that. And it turns out that uh, this is, like I said, a pretty consistent uh, 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 figure or graph, this S-shaped curve. And uh, this is a graph of percent of adoption on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. And it turns out that um, there are two important things to take away. One is there are, remember, this is through communication through social channels. There are differences in characteristics of earlier adopters, people in the middle of the curve, and later adopters. And again, these are pretty consistent whether you're talking about hybrid seed corn or uptake of a new medical treatment or a new education innovation or, or whatever your field is, a technology innovation. There's also things though that affect the rate of diffusion. So he characterized these into five categories. And that's the kind of thing that can shift uh, a curve like innovation three here, which is a longer time to adoption over to something more rapid like the curve marked by innovation one. And then just to make the point that there can be incomplete diffusion of innovations um, as well. But these characteristics are pretty comparable from one field to another, their relative advantage, and you can think in healthcare, how strong is the randomized trial evidence? If it's less strong, it's gonna be harder to, to, to shift that curve. Um, compatibility, is it consistent with what, what adopters have, have used in the past or need? Complexity, if it's really complicated to introduce, that's gonna slow down the, the speed of adoption. Trial ability, if people have to go whole, whole hog into the innovation and give up something else, that's gonna be harder. It's gonna be slower to adopt than something where you can kind of try it out. And observability, if you, if you know it's good for you, but you can't see that it, it, it helps you, it's gonna be uh, most more other things being equal, slower to, to be adopted. So let's look at some of this in healthcare. Um, uh, here's an example of uh, 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 use of beta blocker treatment after MIs. And this was looking at hospitals and the proportion of patients that uh, uh, are, are discharged on a beta blocker after a, a heart attack. And back in 1996, even though there was very strong evidence in favor of this by 1996, you see that there's a whole range of, these are uh, percent the mean percent of patients, but, but across uh, hospitals, whether you're the 10th percentile hospital or the 90th percentile hospital and so forth. And over about this 10 year period, the adoption went up to nearly 100%. So that, you know, even the lowest ranked hospitals were at 90% or higher, which is great. But what happened here was not just sort of just passive diffusion, there was actually a whole host of incentives to hospitals and, to, and a lot of practices about how to improve the likelihood of getting people on this uh, life-saving treatment um, uh, over this period of time. Uh, here's another example of, uh, again, there's this, there was strong evidence um, uh, uh, eventually that thrombolytic ther therapy uh, reduces mortality uh, from heart attacks. And what happened here is this was an analysis where they looked at cumulative randomized trials of thrombolytic therapy and MI. And the problem was that nobody was looking at the cumulative data over time. They were just another trial was published and another trial was published. We didn't have the methods then or the motivation to try to aggregate the data. If we had, then it would have been evidence over a decade earlier that this treatment was life-saving, but instead there were a number of years that passed before it was even recommended as routine care. And lest you think, oh, that's other conditions, it's not neurology, uh, we have our own plenty of examples. 
Um, IVTPA is now a, a staple for acute ischemic stroke. The first trials, though, were published um, in the early 1990s. Uh, there were multiple large scale trials that showed it was uh, very beneficial or beneficial for, for recovery of function. Uh, and the FDA approved it in 1996. However, uh, very slow adoption of this, you know, significant innovation in, in um, improving uh, outcomes of stroke. Nine years after approval, uh, only two to 6.3%, depending on the state of eligible stroke patients received IVTPA. And so this is an example of incomplete diffusion. And again, a substantial missed avoidable mortality, morbidity on a, uh, and mortality on a population basis. So why, wasn't, why was this the case? I mean, why wouldn't people have just jumped on this? It, it turns out when you start to look at what's going on in this system, in this um, organizational and behavioral system, there were some significant barriers that that actually could have been anticipated as the trials were being done, but it was sort of took people by surprise and, uh, at the time. And so it took a while to, to move the needle. One big one was before this treatment came out, nobody was talking about you need to call 911 and rush in if you have, and here are the symptoms of a stroke. So today you're probably all familiar, there's public health campaigns and EMS folks are taught what to do and there's all this stuff. But at that time that it was approved, there was literally nothing. Uh, and basically it was simply the sites that were part of the treatment trials that were even set up. Because when you look at system factors, you had to have a system set up in your ED so that once that patient hit the ED, boom, you've got a neuro exam, boom, you've got a head CT to rule out a bleed and you've got pharmacy lined up to get that drug down and into somebody's um, um, veins. And that just wasn't set up at the time because there were no other acute treatments. Uh, and, and again, the lead institutions were literally the ones that participated in the trials because they'd had to figure all that out. Um, and in another example, what I want to segue into team care approaches is organization of stroke care delivery. So again, uh, back in the early 1990s, there were several large, well-conducted randomized trials that showed that if you provided care for a stroke patient in an organized stroke unit, which had a multidisciplinary team, it actually was a, a yielded lower mortality. So we had A1 level of evidence from, this was published in 2001, but these were studies from the early 1990s that stroke teams actually reduced mortality. And yet we did some work in uh, California in the late uh, 1990s and linked data on um, uh, stroke admissions and uh, up to uh, one year mortality with a survey of all acute care hospitals in California, where among other things we asked, did you have a dedicated stroke service at that hospital, meaning a multi-specialty service that included non-physicians? So did you apply multidisciplinary team care for your stroke patients? And what we found was uh, that when we looked at the association of hospitals that had team kind of stroke service, with mortality, there was a substantial reduction in mortality. So a kind of a confirmation in a real world setting around the state of this, in this case, it was an association following that earlier randomized trial evidence. But only seven and a half percent of all California hospitals had a dedicated stroke service at that time. And there was, again, a very slow diffusion in use of stroke teams in US hospitals. From that number, Larry Goldstein did a survey of North Carolina hospitals. 10 years later, it was 27%. And it had been slow, again, incomplete diffusion. And this is leading to 
a, a lack of savings of lives across populations. Ultimately, what powered the changes were uh, policies, health policies. And um, the argument I wanna present here is that, that for many of the things in this second bottleneck, uh, it's gonna, it requires changes in policy to really um, move them into um, population-based, uh, uh, broad population uptake. In the case of stroke teams, it took a bunch of committed advocates, um, you know, putting, getting American Heart Association on board to do this whole get with the guidelines um, initiative that gives rewards or carrots to hospitals that meet certain standards, including putting things in place that allow them to provide this TPA care more rapidly and to more people. And now it's part of the Joint Commission's review of hospitals to check over, how, do you have systems in place so that you, you can show that you're providing acute stroke care according to teams and, and using the TPA therapy um, and meeting these standards because we know it, it's linked to better quality, better outcomes. So I wanna segue now uh, into talking about uh, uh, my particular passion, which is around team-based coordinated cares. And you saw a hint of that with evidence around stroke teams uh, improving outcomes. And this is getting back to this model of, we know there's low delay to, uh, or delayed diffusion of treatments with known efficacy from randomized trials. How do we get that into higher use in real world populations? And in this particular example, this is about generating evidence on team care, in this case for a chronic neurological condition, dementia, where the main audience, as it turned out, was policymakers. Although when we started this research, that was not where we had our, our, our site set. But let me walk you through this. So the questions are, could, would a team care coordinated approach for chronic neurological disorder over the usual way we deliver care produce better outcomes? And if so, um, are there uh, incentives that can be changed to promote them? Uh, there are more widespread use. So let me give you a couple of examples of why a team care coordinated care approach is necessary to produce better outcomes in, in dementia. So there was a fair body of research that for example, if, if caregivers were provided respite and support, some kinds of education training, but some respite services, it delayed the likelihood that the patient with dementia would be um, heading to a nursing home. And there'd been pretty substantial evidence around even back to 1990s for the benefits of this caregiver respite services. But there was a lot of evidence that that wasn't diffused into practice. So here's an example of a survey we did of three health plans in San Diego County. And we asked caregivers of persons with established dementia, a, du a duration of at least a, a, of a mean of two and a half years, had they ever received some or all they needed of these services and only about less than 20% of caregivers said they'd received respite care services. So again, a, a gap between what could be best outcomes and what was actually being delivered. There was also good scientific evidence that, that the safest and the most effective first line treatment for behavior problems in dementia are non-pharmacologic approaches. But, as an example, uh, there was a survey of physicians asking them in a certain scenario, what would you, how would you manage this first behavioral manifestation? And more than half said they would start them on a drug and only one in five would choose a psychosocial approach. So there's other evidence. I'm just trying to give you some examples here. So when you put together this, a larger body of evidence and including this, the logical train here is, uh, it looks like uh, 
because respite services are typically not provided by health systems, they're provided by resources in the community. And behavior management training for caregivers, again, typically provided by Alzheimer's Association or community agencies, not by healthcare systems. So there's clearly a problem around coordinating and handing off receipt of these vital, you know, really important services and training between health systems where patients show up and the community agencies where the caregivers would need to get those services or training. And there were other factors going on. There were other issues going on. A lot of provider nihilism about dementia. Well, why should I spend time dealing with this? Because there's nothing that can make it better. And then a big one, time constraints. So if there's a, an issue requiring um, getting a services of a social worker to help work through a problem with a caregiver who, who needs to get off work to be able to take care of their loved one, physicians don't have that time, they don't have the skills, and social workers aren't reimbursed under the way we, for the most part, had been paying for healthcare, which is we pay for a visit to a doctor, not for other people on a care team. So this was leading to a lack of people following up because there's really nobody being paid to do proactive follow-up and leading to more crisis-oriented problems. So when you conceptualize patients and caregivers, eventually patients with dementia get linked to healthcare providers way down the line often they get linked to community agencies where there's those kinds of services and community agencies and healthcare systems under the way we usually provide care and the way dementia care is now paid for they're not connected so our goal was to uh, throw out thinking about traditional fee for service uh, care and think outside the box about what's a different way of delivering chronic care that could include coordinating care with community agencies, activating, making sure caregivers are activated on how to manage issues that use health IT in a smart way, decision support, and ultimately, can that yield better outcomes? And the goal, again, to provide evidence to those people who can uh, create mechanisms to change the way uh, uh, care is incentivized. And one model that we drew from in this particular project was the chronic care model. It's been around for several decades, but it basically is a broad conceptual model that says, you know, in instead of thinking it's all about a doctor and a patient in the visit, <laughs> it's thinking about where, where do people live in their communities? Who are the who's on the team that can provide the right services at the right time? Um, how do we use our IT systems to help us make sure we're not letting people slip through the cracks? And how do we identify and manage a panel of people instead of, you know, from the beginning at the time of diagnosis, instead of waiting and reacting to crises that arise? And notably in the chronic care model, none of the features I just listed are paid for, certainly not paid for directly and most of them not paid for at all under the fee for service payment system. So in our study, what we did was we set up this alternative model for dementia care, a team-based coordinated model we started with saying, we're gonna identify all patients with dementia in three different health plans in San Diego. We're gonna uh, involve a care manager. We're gonna introduce a new team member who's either a nurse or a social worker, who's gonna administer an assessment battery before somebody's had a crisis. This starts from the get-go. And with a whole team that's planned, what are the pathways that that assessment is gonna trigger for people who are at risk of having a complication? For example, does the caregiver seem like they could benefit from respite services? Then that care manager is gonna plug them in actively to the community agencies that are gonna 
get them those respite services rather than waiting until a crisis has happened and it's too late to be a benefit. And you'll see in this model, instead of weak links or no links between patient caregiver dyads, health systems, and community agencies, they're all connected proactively, met regularly together to discuss policies around care and care handoffs, and also around uh, particular protocols. And we incorporated an IT system that let them all share a care plan uh, so that they could see what had been done by others and, and so forth. So a model that's going from a proactive preventive uh, team care approach based on the, the things that were relevant to dementia care. Um, and uh, then we tested it, because if you want to you want to know whether it's really better than something else, you have to do pretty much the gold standard or randomized trial. Only instead of a trial of a drug or a surgery, we're, we're conducting a trial of a model of care. So we had a pre-post experimental design where we had patients who were in caregiver dyads who were randomized to receive the new care model and those that continued to receive care as usual. We followed them for 18 months. We implemented the model at a subset of clinics, like I said, in three healthcare organizations in San Diego. They were all Medicare enrollees, 408 dyads were enrolled, and it was an intention to treat analysis, meaning even if you were enrolled, you were offered the intervention services and you declined them, you were counted as being in the intervention arm. And what we found was the y-axis here, think of that as health or quality of care or health benefit. And the x-axis is four different clusters of indicators of quality. So one was in a cluster of indicators that had to do with assessing for problems. One was a cluster, cluster on treatment. Um, uh, for example, the, the behavioral management strategies for uh, uh, non-pharmacologic strategies for behavioral issues. One was a cluster on caregiver education and one was a cluster of safety issues. Because people with dementia are at risk of all kinds of safety concerns. And at the end of 18 months and adjusting for baseline, we found that we more than overall in every indicator doubled and sometimes more than doubled the quality of care or the delivery of uh, appropriate care that was going to link that was linked from prior studies to better outcomes. So um, uh, this was pretty striking evidence and very significant. Um, when we went back and analyzed, uh, were there subgroups who benefited more than others? We looked at caregiver level of education. And if you divided up the intervention arm into the level of caregiver education, what you saw at baseline, again, this the y-axis is better quality of care, you know, receipt of the kind of treatment that leads to better outcomes. And the y the x-axis is by group of whether less than high school all the way to at least a four-year degree of caregiver education. And you see a gradient that's pretty well described, whether it's socioeconomic gradient, education gradient, uh, race, ethnicity, where there's higher quality uh, 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 or, or health of delivery uh, among higher education in this case than lower education. And what we found though was that uh, uh, at the end of the uh, trial, those with uh, less than a high school education, that the, the gradient was eliminated. And, and in a few of the domains we looked at, there was a reverse trend, meaning the people who benefited the most were those with less, the caregivers with less than a high school education. So this was not what we were particularly aiming for, but we certainly learned something about how these kinds of models not only improve health overall, but are, are able to reverse 
um, uh, and at least eliminate disparities in care quality by caregiver level of education and potentially other indicators. So when we published this, we were so excited. You know, the usual fee for service care in an editorial was this, you really need team-based care that's integrated with social and community services. And an editorial at the time said, it's time for Medicare to pay for this because this clearly improves quality of care. So we were really excited and we thought, yeah, we agree with that. And we went around and were ready to disseminate this model and you know, have training. And what we found was health system said, if we implement this model, it is fantastic. It would improve quality of care, but it will cost us money because we will lose money delivering this kind of program because that's not what we're paid to do. What we're paid to provide is, is care that's not you know, delivered in this format. So I think that heightened um, you know, uh, what perhaps should have been an obvious understanding that, that this type of evidence uh, can inform, you have to think about who the audience is. And in this case, we really, should have been all along thinking about um, uh, uh, policymakers as the audience. And uh, so we went forward and did, you know, to advanced our work in some other care models and uh, uh, hoped that we were providing, that we had helped provide evidence for those policymakers. Then in 2010, sort of a breakthrough, the first kind of a breakthrough occurred. Many of you all know that the Affordable Care Act in Title II, uh, which you're very familiar with Medicaid expansion, which is a big part of that uh, uh, act and has um, certainly helped uh, with providing more access to care in many states around the country. But there was another title in there that was all about a package of um, uh, 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 incentives for uh, health systems to uh, innovate in the space of delivering care differently than fee-for-service care to improve quality and reduce cost. And it turns out that a lot of these models, like almost all of them, go hand in hand with cost efficiency. And you can think through that conceptually with examples, but it, 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 it it actually uh, makes sense if you're if you're preventing if, if you're thinking about costs from a societal perspective. If you're a hospital and and uh, you may you know you may have some value to uh, financial to admitting people who have a, a you know a behavioral issue that's escalated, but from a societal perspective, if you could prevent those kinds of things, um, it's cost effective. So. The problem is that um, the incentives are, you know, I think with the Affordable Care Act in particular was trying to like move a step further along this uh, path to move out of FIFA service-based care for chronic conditions. There were some baby steps that came out of this. So uh, for example, a CPT code has come out saying that if you, provide the range of services such as what we literally developed in our model, uh, you can bill for that and get reimbursed and it doesn't have to be the doctor that delivers it. So I call that, uh, you know, it's, it's baby steps because it's not really incentivizing the whole model, but it's certainly incentivizing some components of it, but it's still lacking teeth. And really the bigger leap is into changing payment in a more wholesale way. And when people talk about value-based payment, it's, it's a big switch. It's basically a, a, a full thickness or a full force value-based payment means, uh, here's an example. Uh, health system, you're gonna take care of a thousand of our patients. Uh, an insurer says a thousand of our patients with dementia and we're going to negotiate a price for managing the care of those thousand patients. And you have to meet certain goal, goals at the end of the year to show that you have 
um, produced better health or, or improved outcomes or at least prevented declines. Um, and if you do, you get to keep some of the money we negotiated. But if you don't, then there'll be some penalties. And so what that does is it flips the switch in a big way so that the incentives are now on the delivery systems to, instead of saying I would lose money on a, on a coordinated care model, my God, where are they? And how can we adopt them and put them in place? Because those kind of models are gonna help us meet the value goals and the quality of care goals and also uh, be cost efficient from a societal perspective, but the reward comes back to the delivery system. It's really changing the incentives entirely on its head, going from widgets to quality. So these are really at the core of this, um, you know, uh, uh, change in payment system that's slowly underway. But unless the financial risk shifts, it, it's not likely to, to come full force. Whoops. Um, sorry. So um, we're in somewhere in this revenue transition period going from fee-for-service to more value-based reimbursement. But it's been a, a slow path. So going back to 2015, the HHS Secretary Bolt Burwell published an editorial saying we're going full force into this with Medicare. Uh, under the next administration, March of 2018, Alex Azar, there's no turning back to moving forward into value-based payment. Um, but there have been some, you know, uh, other things that have happened in healthcare in the last few years. And looking forward, uh, obviously the Biden administration is going to be focused a lot on COVID, but value-based care and continuing this paradigm shift that began actually under George W. Bush uh, is part of the priorities for the next four years as well. So we shall see how fast and, and how um, effectively that transition occurs. In the meantime, a goal that I've had for a few years since coming here, but which is now we're really moving forward on is to have Sinai Neurology be um, the forefront of academic medical centers that are adopting these models these types of models so that we're ready for those bigger changes in payment that are surely gonna come. There's just too many reasons why better care and at a lower cost is, is, is a priority and it's a bipartisan priority. Um, so we have to do it though in a way that's sustainable to the health system because we're in that in-between mix. So we're, uh, Starting out with three conditions, dementia, MS, ALS, we've already started some of the work in dementia care. And through some philanthropy and through some internal funding through the Office of Wellbeing and Resistance and with our teams in place who can help put this kind of change of care model in place, um, we're starting this, uh, we're, we're moving this progress pro process forward in a bigger way in 2021. Uh, our ultimate goals are to follow good rigor for implementation um, science, to measure the outcomes, to be measuring how we put the change models in place, but literally moving toward that example I showed you of a coordinated team care model for these three conditions. And, but to do it in a, in a sustainable way, both in terms of the care and the finances. So I am um, very excited about this time ahead. I just wanna close with saying that, um, you know, this is, this is a, a group from our, um, some uh, stroke prevention implementation research center that um, work I finished up in the last five years. Um, but also funders for some of the prior studies that I showed you. It, it literally does take a village to do this type of multidisciplinary work, um, but I'm excited about the times ahead as we move into 
sustainable practices and we are anticipating the policy changes are coming. So thank you very much. Excellent. Thanks so much, Barbara. Maybe uh, stop sharing. That way we can look at each other. And uh, we do have uh, some time for questions. So I urge people to unmute themselves and ask a question. Who wants to go first? Don't be bashful. Um, this is Mary. Could I ask a question? Yeah, of course, Mary. Go ahead. Great, it's a wonderful talk, Barbara. Um, I'm curious as to whether um, the uh, um, finances around this are based on a single diagnosis. So for example, um, if a person um, is using value-based care for the care of their dementia and then get a second condition or a second disease, what's the model? Is it a new fee-for-service? Is it a new... Um, uh, amount of money that gets put aside or is the expectation once you have this disease, that's how you're defined. And, and I guess the reason I think about this is there's so much direct to consumer marketing these days that it would be very hard for the clinician um, to direct the care and rise above the um, uh, costs that might be incurred by this direct to consumer mm -hmm. approach. Yeah, there's several questions uh, to unpack there. I think that uh, a part of my culture shock coming from the West Coast where there was a lot of managed care and then you come here and it's like, you know, people gone to, they go to four different places around uh, the system. So some of that would have to be potentially addressed by you know, maybe people being attracted to the fact that you coordinate with your other subspecialties. So the umbrella for dementia care delivery, that care coordinator could, there could be pathways for how do you partner to make sure that when people see other subspecialists that, that there's coordination across those. I mean, one of the things that came up in the dementia care um, uh, work was people would, the caregivers would talk about taking the the person with dementia to see some other provider and it turned out they didn't know they had dementia. <laughs> they weren't in the room with them when they went over the prescriptions and stuff like that. So the umbrella for this can be broader, but part of the model is how do you interface with other specialists? And ideally you'd be incorporating some estimate of comorbidity or other complexity into your estimations of the cost. I mean, there's there's still stuff about how do you estimate this? There's, there's all kinds of other you know, bundled payments and other things that are being done on the finance end. And, and, and so that's work that we have to partner with the business entities to figure out because that's, but it's an unknown. I mean, and not many places are doing that, but it's it's a really important. And, and it's gonna be tougher in an environment where people go, multiple places, yeah. Mm -hmm. We have time for one more question. Well, we're right at the end of the hour. So I guess we should end. You know, Barbara, one of the things that has struck me is that the field has been talking about these changes for so long. You even referred to this uh, in your talk and it the system seems stubbornly resistant to affecting these efficiencies and improved care. Uh, but maybe we're at a tipping point now where, where we can finally achieve that. Yeah, I think, um, you know, again, we're seeing it as a priority. Obviously, the new administration is going to focus a lot on COVID. But, it, it, you know, what keeps coming out is the way we've set up our system of care it isn't efficient at even getting vaccinations out. Um, but it, there's also, unfortunately, just big escalation in the, in the deficit and in healthcare costs from COVID. And it ought to be the case that if anything, that's going to make this more of a priority to, to push for these changes. Yeah, um, that makes a lot of sense. Anyway, thank you for a great talk. Really appreciate it. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank bye you. Bye.